All right. Good evening to you. Good to see you this Wednesday evening. Fall is here. Feels like fall now, doesn't it? Uh, open your Bibles to Acts 25. Acts chapter 25. I find these later chapters in Acts to be probably some of the most straightforward in the whole book. It's just this real easy narrative. Um, not as much, to me, not as much um, doctrinal material like you'll have in the early chapters about conversions and things of that nature because that's not what Paul's dealing with in these chapters. I'm not saying it's not important, it's just, it's just a little different. So it didn't take us, I don't think, as much effort to go through these later chapters as it does thinking about some of the more doctrinal issues as Luke writes in the early chapters of Acts. But we'll, we'll keep forging ahead. We only have uh, uh, three lessons after tonight, and then the quarter is done. So let's begin with our Acts facts. Straight up, no games. Because <laughs> I got a lot of lip out of you, Sunday. <laughs> you, you tricked me. That was mean. You tricked me. That's all right. That's okay. It's all in good fun. All right, chapter one, ascension and appointment. Chapter two, Pentecost, Pentecost and Peter's preaching. Chapter three, a man in lesson. Chapter four, chapter five, chapter six, chapter seven, Stephen Stone. Chapter eight. Samarian salvation. Chapter 9. It's all saved. Dorcas delivered. Chapter 10. Cornelius converted. First Gentile. Chapter 11. Report and relief. Chapter 12. Persecution. Peter and pride. Chapter 13. And chapter 14. All right. Chapter 15. Disagreement and decision. The Jerusalem Conference over circumcision. Chapter 16. A little quick there, wasn't it? Chapter 17. Addressing Athens. Sermon on Mars Hill. Chapter 18. Achaia, Antioch, and Apollos. End of the second journey. Chapter 19. Rebaptism, repentance, and riot. Paul is in what city in that chapter? Ephesus. Chapter 20. He goes back up through Macedonia, down to Miletus, where he called for those elders right there, Ephesian elders, and that's the end of chapter 20. All right, chapter 21, Jerusalem and Jewish mob. Finally, Paul gets back to Jerusalem and must now face the Jews. Chapter 22, review and rejection. 22, again, 22 and 26 will be similar because Paul tells his story in both chapters of his trip to Damascus and his uh, eventual conversion. So review and rejection. Chapter 23, counsel and conspiracy. He, Paul addresses the Sanhedrin and then that plot against his life is learned by his, uh, his Paul's nephew. He gets the word to Paul. All right, 24. Caesarea confinement. He's in prison for two years in Caesarea, which is, we're getting closer and closer to what we're talking about this evening. Then last lesson, chapter 25. That's tonight. Are we in, oh, we are. <laughs> See? I thought we were on 26. I need to sit down and let somebody else teach this class. That was awful. Well, that was a test. And you did really well. No, I got ahead of myself. All right. Yes, we're on appeal in Agrippa this evening. That's embarrassing. All right. Very good. Very good. What's 26, by the way? Review and ridicule. That's right. Review and ridicule. It will sound a lot like 22. And we'll get that, Lord willing, on Sunday. All right. So tonight we're talking about uh, Paul makes his appeal to Caesar, which he's allowed to do as a Roman citizen, and we'll get to that, and then he is going to uh, appear before Agrippa, but first he's before Festus, so let's, uh, 
what set the stage? How does how does Festus plug into this story? Who has Paul already appealed before? Appeared before Felix, and now this is Festus, and Nero replaced Felix with Festus. There, he's the he's the governor. He's the um, uh, but whatever term your your version may use. He's he's just the he's the official over that district. Uh, and, of course, the headquarters is in Caesarea, not Jerusalem. So Paul's case is now being brought before Festus. That gets us to the first 12 verses of chapter 12. So let's look at these uh, together. At the end of 24, we just, again, we, just, we pick up the train of thought. Luke wrote at the end of that chapter that two years went by and Paul uh, stayed there. Uh, in, in confinement, in custody, and that's when Nero replaced Felix with Festus. And so, that being the case, then uh, Luke begins the chapter by saying, Festus, therefore, having arrived in the province three days later. I get that to mean three days after his, uh, his, his, his uh, job of replacing Felix. I'm getting a little brain fog tonight. So it's just, it's just real quick after the other. There's no large break in time between the end of 24 and beginning of 25. So the narrative just goes right on ahead. And I get the idea again, the Jews waste no time. They're, they're, they're very, you, you got to give the Jews an A for persistence. I mean, they, they don't waste any time. New governor, let's get right back on Paul's case and maybe we can convince him to let him be delivered to us so that we can execute him. So verse 2, Luke writes that the chief priest and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul and they were urging him, my version reads, requesting a concession against Paul that he might have him brought to Jerusalem. Now, at the end of verse 3, um, I, don't, I don't recall noticing this the last time I studied Acts. And maybe I did, I just forgot it. But what piece of information is in the end of verse 3 that gives us a connection back to chapter 24? Apparently, what's still alive? Yeah, that plot is still there. So it wasn't permanently thwarted. Now, Paul's nephew, again, got Paul rescued the first time, but this plot is still there. And so uh, Festus was not part of the first one, obviously. He wasn't in charge. He, he wasn't ruling as governor then. But now that he's here, so the Jews hop right back on that same bandwagon, if you will, and they're urging the governor, pleading, requesting, I uh, just... Get begging, possibly, is the equivalent word. Let us have Paul, uh, because they still have this, this plot. So they continue pressing charges, again, like they did before. There's, there's no difference here. And, again, at the end of verse 3, they continue to have the request be made known to Paul, bring him to Jerusalem, so that they could ambush him. Again, that's like they did before. So they're not changing their actions. They're not, they're not changing their playbook. It's, it's all... Pretty much the same right down the line. So that takes us into verse 4, as Luke writes. And I don't get the idea that Festus has any, any notion of what was attempted before. Because he wasn't even around. But you gotta give you got to give Festus kudos here. Because what does he say in verse 4? And he's got no axe to grind, really, with the Jews or with Paul. He's, he's the new guy. But what is his position? Based on verse 4. Because, verse 5, let them prosecute him where it, where it uh, happened. And let's jump ahead just for the moment. Drop down to verse 16 when Festus is telling his Paul story to Agrippa. What's the point that he makes in verse 16? Which is why he would not let them have Paul just off the top of the bat. What, what was Roman law? Yeah, you have the right to meet your accusers. And Festus hasn't heard the case yet. Now, there was a previous session, if you will, but again, Festus wasn't part of that. So I get the idea, as far as he's concerned, he doesn't really care what Felix did. That was Felix's rule. Now, this is mine, and I'm going to hear the case. So you can urge me, you can beg me all you want to, to have him you know, handed over to you, and whatever happens, happens. But no, I'm going to hear the case. And so you're going to go with me from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And the man has the right 
any man has the right to face his accusers. So again, as Luke writes, uh, he himself in, in verse 4 was about to leave shortly, and he said in verse 5, let the influential men among you go there with me to Jerusalem. And if there's anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. So that's, that's his position. And I, I, I mean, he's not a, I don't think Festus is a great moral pillar. I'm, I'm just saying I, he's on the right side of law here with respect to Paul's civil case. And I think we need to call that out for what it is. That, that was an honorable thing to, to do. So again, Luke writes in verse 6, not much more time has gone by. This time it's 8 to 10 days, so a little more than a week. Not, not weeks, not months. 8 to 10 days later, um, Festus arrives in Caesarea. On the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought before him. And so Paul was brought in. And this is the first time he appears before this governor. That's verses 7 through 12. And here's how this played out, if you will. Does your version say in verse uh, 7 that the Jews who came down from Jerusalem stood around Paul? Stood about or around? I get the idea that this was uh, an act of intimidation, maybe. It's one thing just to make the charges, but also we're going we're gonna to surround him. We want this to be just as effective as it can. Don't know how many it is, but it's plural. So it was in, the influential men is what Festus asked for back in verse uh, 5. So however it was, they surround Paul and they bring many and serious charges against him. The last thing Luke writes in verse, verse 7, what about those charges? They cannot be proven. Unprovable charges. And again, that's not, that, that's not changed since the first time this began when he stood before Felix. And Paul continued to assert his innocence, if you will. Notice what he says in verse 8. I have committed no offense. And there's four things he mentions. No offense against what? The law? The Jews? The temple? Or Caesar? He mentions all four of those. Now, three of them have to do with the Jewish religion. But he specifically says, I have done a thing. To these people, to the to the temple, recall back with Felix, the assumption had been made that Paul desecrated the temple with Trophimus, because they saw him in the city, so they assumed he took this Gentile into the into the court, which wasn't the case. But anyway, Paul again brings up the fact that I haven't done anything to anybody, uh, so he continues to assert his innocence. Now, that's the last thing that Luke writes in terms of a of a dialogue between Paul and as he's meeting his accusers face to face. So that's what they talk about. The next thing to me is interesting, verse 9. What does Luke write about Festus? Not something that he says, but Luke knows this, I guess, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, where have you heard that before? <laughs> Why did Paul stay in custody for two years? Because Felix did the Jews a favor. By leaving him there. So now Festus, it reads, he wishes to do the Jews a favor. And then he asks Paul the question, are you willing to face these charges in Jerusalem? This was a favor to the Jews. And I'm not saying this. I'm just posing the question. Do you think there may be anything of a complicit nature with the plans for ambush? I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But Luke does write Festus is willing to at least bend over that far backwards to do the Jews a favor. He's supposed to be impartial. I mean, he's the governor. And let's just try the case on the merits of the law. And people are presumed to be innocent before it's proven. But Luke does write this. And so he asks this question. I'm just suggesting maybe there's some complicit nature with this, but I can't prove it. David? I was reading some in Josephus that you mentioned last class. That whole area at this time was like a powder keg. Yes. Maybe so. Maybe I mean, by all rights, Rome could put the hammer down any time and say, "Look, knock this, knock this unrest off." We're we're going to have law and order, which they were known for that. But politics is involved. I mean, then and today, and so you one hand will wash the other, so forth and so on. And so, but perhaps Festus was doing that for that reason. That's that's certainly a possibility.
Whatever the reason was, the Bible doesn't know, and we shouldn't really care, but that is in Festus' mind. Luke does tell us that. So that was the reason, it seems, for him asking the question. Paul's pretty cagey. He's not been fooled. And so, to me, what Paul does, Paul's not going to be tricked, and perhaps he knew the possibility still exists for what? Well, if it happened once, they want me to go to Jerusalem, it could probably happen again. Now, he was informed the first time by his nephew. There's no such information this time. But if you've been through something once before, and if what's happening now still smells like that, then what you, what's your mind going to think? Well, I'm, no, I'm not going to do this. So to me, what Paul does is he, does the, he plays a trump card. He does the unexpected. I don't think anybody saw this coming. I don't know that. It just seems to me, if you just read the story. So Festus says, Festus' mind is, I'm going to do the Jews a favor. Paul, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and face charges? Paul's mind yeah, I'm not falling for this, because <laughs> that ambush is probably still there. So he says what? I appeal to Caesar. Could any Roman citizen appeal to Caesar? Yes, that was the law. That doesn't mean you get your case heard before the emperor, but you had the right to do that. And like our government, I'm sure there were bureaucratic layers that your case could be heard up the, up the chain. And maybe your case would go all the way to the throne. I don't know. But Paul at least makes the claim. What happened when a Roman citizen made an appeal to Caesar? In terms of the case he or she was in. It's over. Whatever's happened is going to stop. Because now the officials are duty bound to, take, to send you, at least through the process, to go to, to, go to Rome and to see Caesar. To have your case heard. So that, that ended... <laughs> That ended the plans for the Jews. And again, Festus is now duty-bound to honor Paul's appeal to the emperor. So we're going to talk about these are our two teaching points this evening. Um, the second one, I, I, I do want to spend some time on this. I, I think there's, I think there's some, some things that can really sink our teeth into that I think even we can tell the children when we go through this chapter about uh, Paul making his appeal to Caesar. And again, this, this one, we've discussed this somewhat already. This is the idea of uh, Christians have civil rights. I mean, we do. And those can be availed when necessary. So we'll talk about those at the end of our class. So that really puts Festus in a dilemma. This is now verses 13 through 22, which is the major part of the middle of the chapter. So Agrippa II and Bernice come calling, and this is a political uh, call is just just making nice with with the new governor, and let me show our Herod chart again that we showed this past Lord's Day, this past Sunday. So again, um, it all starts in the New Testament with Herod the Great, and we know who he was. And then we've studied it when we were in the Gospels. We studied about uh, Philip and uh, Antipas as well, and uh, uh, Agrippa the first. That would have been Herod Agrippa the second's father. But Aristobulus had these, had these two children here, and Herodias certainly comes into play with Philip and uh, John's preaching about her being unlawfully married. But Herod Agrippa's three children were Herod Agrippa II, which is this Agrippa in our text tonight, plus Bernice and Drusilla. Now, where have we heard about Drusilla already? Last chapter? Who was she? She was the wife of Felix, who was Festus's predecessor. This has, and again, Josephus writes a lot about this. Historians will. Agrippa II and Bernice were living in incest. They were brother and sister. She did marry uh, other uh, uh, officials, but I think the, 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 the Waldrons talk about this in their book as well. She always came back to her brother. And so it was not a moral situation whatsoever. So they're together as Luke just drops them into the chapter here by inspiration. So Agrippa II and Bernice come calling on Festus, make a, make a nice little um, uh, visit here. And after many days, Luke writes in verse 14, many days later, 
Festus lays Paul's case before the king. So apparently he doesn't think Agrippa knows about it. So let me tell you what I've got. This was dropped in my lap. <laughs> and I've got to do something with it now, again, because Paul has changed everything by appealing to the emperor. So Festus just lays out the details of the case. Here's what he says. He says, Felix left Paul. He is a prisoner. He left him behind for me to deal with. He didn't deal with him, so two years went by, and now he's just, he's just thrust upon me. In Jerusalem, the Jews had asked Festus to condemn him. We see that there in verse 15. When I was at Jerusalem, the chief priest and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation. It wasn't just asking, can you deliver him to us? They, I mean, they were up front and said, look, we, we want to put him to death. We want to execute him. So Felix tells Agrippa that. But then he says, as we already alluded to in verse 16, but Roman law demands that a man can face his accusers. So I did not relent to this request of theirs. I didn't hand him over and just let them do whatever they wanted to with him. That would have been against Roman law. So in Caesarea, which is where we've been before Agrippa and, his, and Bernice come, what Festus heard from the Jews surprised him. What, what does he say in verse uh, 17? When they had assembled here, that is where they are, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal, and ordered Paul to be brought. And when the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges, this is verse 18, against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting. What was, the, what was Festus expecting to hear as the governor in his official capacity? Yes, against civil law. Uh, this likely was not the first case he'd ever heard. His job as governor whatever he was promoted to before this or he of some other uh, position before being posted in Caesarea, he would have heard cases before. So this was not new to him, I would assume. So he's expecting, here come the accusers. Here's this man standing. Maybe he's shackled. Maybe he's chained. Uh, he's, been in, he's, he's been in custody for over two years. I expected to hear all these charges about he was a, he was a lawbreaker. He's done this. He's done that. He's, he's upset the public. I mean, he's done one thing after... He says, I didn't get any of that. What was the, what was the nature of what I heard, does he say? And he's pretty specific. What he tells Agrippa. It was about their religion. And then he really says something interesting. Paul keeps talking about this man named Jesus. Keep going, what does he say? Who They kill, but Paul keeps affirming... He's alive. Now, those of you who are in the first quarter, we saw this a lot in the early chapters. What was a major, major part, in fact, we may say the major part of the early preaching of the gospel? God, you killed him. He, the, Peter uh, twice in, his, in both his sermons. Paul in, I believe in Acts 13 when he reviewed the, so that, that Jewish history other inspired uh, preacher Stephen when he gave his defense preachers repeatedly said to the Jews if they were in their audience you put him to death but in the next breath they all said but God raised him up so notice what has Paul been preaching about we don't really have any idea or any recorded sermon or talks that Paul was giving public addresses during this two years. But Festus as much tells us, what's Paul been talking about the whole time? First off, I said this Sunday, not about what? Himself. Get me out of here. <laughs> Most people would say, I am innocent. Which Paul said, I'm innocent, but I've, I've been railroaded. I don't deserve to be in here, blah, 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 blah. No, Paul is preaching the gospel. Paul is saying, I am affirming Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth. He is alive. He's been raised from the dead. And to me, as Festus relates this story to Agrippa, that catches the governor off guard. What does he know about a resurrection anyway? He's a pagan. He's not a believer in Christ. So that's what he tells Festus. Oh, that's what he tells Agrippa. I keep hearing. Paul's claiming that this Jesus has been raised from the dead. So I don't know what to do with this. I mean, he's, he's really, it appears he's just dumbfounded. So all he could think to do as he tells Agrippa in verse 20, 
at being at a loss how to investigate such matters, he says, well, let's just change venue. <laughs> That's a legal term. Let's move the case from here back to Jerusalem. Perhaps, and I'm, again, I'm saying perhaps, perhaps Festus thought Jerusalem was the center of these religious differences. That's where the accusers are from. Maybe we could get to the bottom of it since it, since it surrounded this religious issue. Let's go back to where it probably all happened. Where was Jesus crucified in Jerusalem? So let's just all go back there. And that was his, that, he said, that, that's, that's where I am with all this. But Paul's appeal to Caesar stopped all that. Put a sudden halt to it. And so he just really is laying out his case before Agrippa saying, look, I'm, I'm at a dead end here. I don't know what else to do. Paul appealed and I've, I've got to honor that. So after he goes through all those points, you get down to verse 22. What's Agrippa say? Well, you know what, Festus, I'd like to hear him myself. Now, but just that could and was easily arranged. So Festus says, well, you know what, tomorrow you will. I'll have him brought in here and you can hear him. Because what does Festus have to do? In fact, we haven't got those verses yet, but the next ones we're going to discuss. Festus pretty much says what he, his main concern is, he's got to send Paul to Rome, but what hasn't happened? He's got to write something. You just can't dump a prisoner on the emperor. <laughs> that just wasn't done. I've got to send some kind of official paperwork, and I don't know what to write. So that Agrippa wants to hear, Festus probably thought, that's a great idea. Maybe he can give me some insight into what I can write in the supporting documentation that's going to go with this prisoner as he's made his appeal to the emperor. And that, again, is, is, the, is the part here that we're coming to, verses 23 through 26 or 27. So Paul has appeared before Festus. Then we've talked about Festus' dilemma. And he has a big one. He doesn't he know what to do with this. And so Festus having told Agrippa about all this, now Agrippa says, well, I, I want to hear him. So that's where we are in the last part of the chapter. Now Paul makes his appearance before Agrippa. So verse 23, Luke writes, the next day when Agrippa had come together with Bernice amid great pomp, the New American Standard reads, it's pageantry. I mean, it was you just can imagine, weighed everything out. It was just a big state affair, obviously. So maybe bands were playing, and I don't know who else was doing their banners and so forth and so on. So it was just some big to do. And all that gets done, had entered the auditorium, accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city at the command of Festus, all right, bring the prisoner in. So that's really why we're here. So Paul's brought in, and now Festus has to make another speech, if you will. So here's what Festus says. He presents Paul to Agrippa. He says, here is the man that the Jews want executed. That's, that's him right there. So Agrippa sees him now for the first time. He admits he hasn't done one thing deserving of death. I'll tell you, to actually say that publicly and have to go through all this? Uh, obviously. He states, again, that Paul had made the legal appear, uh, appeal to the emperor. And then here's where we just talked about. Verse 25, when he says that Paul uh, has made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet, verse 26, I have nothing definite about him to write to my Lord, speaking of Caesar. That indicates he had to write something. Because, again, you just can't send a prisoner. I don't think the emperor, Caesar, wouldn't have appreciated that. I've got nothing to write. So, therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges that are against him. So, he hoped Agrippa, after hearing Paul for himself, could provide something. Uh, does Agrippa have any insight into Paul's ethnicity or maybe even his religion that Festus doesn't have? Well, the Herods were, they had, a, they had somewhat of a Jewish background. I don't, they, they weren't full-blooded Jews. I think they were... Um, Edomites, thank you. I couldn't think of the word. So, which is closer than Roman was. So they may have had some idea of what's, of what's going on. 
And in fact, in 26, at the end of Paul's little speech, what does, we're going ahead just for the moment, but look in verse uh, 27 and 28. Paul says to Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. He's had some exposure to prophetic writings. And what did Agrippa famously say? You almost persuade me. Paul, you're getting real close to, I'm listening to what you're saying. So there's some exposure here. And I don't know that Festus knew this, but perhaps Festus is just hoping this guy will be able to help me understand something. Because my job as the governor, I've got to send supporting documentation with him as he's made his appeal to the, to the emperor. So that's where this chapter um, concludes with, with uh, Paul being brought before. And now he's going to give his speech. Again, part of which will be the Lord willing Sunday morning is his review of his story, his trip to Damascus. And he goes through some of the same points we saw in chapter 9 and chapter 22. All right. Anybody have any comments or questions before we get to a couple of teaching points? I think so, and uh, bless their hearts, they, they took that, they took that vow, and uh, hmm, I don't know how, how they're doing. <laughs> That's a little humor's good. All right, Any, anybody else? I was wondering if that reflected poorly on Festus to have to send Paul to Caesar. You know, you know why couldn't you handle that? I don't know. Uh, maybe the emperor could have thought that, but again... That may have been a provision in the law that a citizen could at any time, if he or she or they felt like they were not getting redress within the civil, the civil structure of Roman law. Maybe it didn't reflect poorly on the local authorities. Maybe it was just like, well, you know what? You make an appeal, then this local stuff stops and you get to, you get to take your case up the chain. I don't know. Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. But that's a, that's a good observation. All right, anybody else? We've got about seven or minutes or so. Let me talk about this one. We've discussed this somewhat. I don't want to beat this into the ground, but again, I think this comes into play here in uh, chapter 25. Christians do have rights and responsibilities, and I want to talk about both of these here just in a, in a brief moment under civil law. So rights, and I've shown some of these points before, we are citizens of a greater kingdom. Philippians 3 says we are citizens, we have our citizenship in heaven. Hebrews 12 says that we, we have received that kingdom that cannot be shaken. So we're in the kingdom of God. That's our, that's our first allegiance. That's our first loyalty. But Romans 13, and I believe these chapters here in Acts do teach us that we are permitted to avail ourselves of our civil rights if we have been disadvantaged unlawfully as being citizens in this lower kingdom. And I believe that's what Paul did here by appealing to Caesar. Now, as I showed on the previous chart, we're not talking about suffering for the gospel. We're talking about when your civil rights are being violated politically or civilly is what Paul did. Now, that's, that's his response. That would be his right. He had the right to do that. But let's look at the reverse of this, and I think this is important. If Christians violate civil law, they need to accept full responsibility for their actions, even if it means death. Let me tell you a true story real quickly. We were living in Knoxville, and a, a man came to worship with us. His parents were already members there, and he moved, he moved to Knoxville to live with them for a while. Unbeknownst to the elders of the local church there, he had committed what was in essence statutory rape against one of his stepdaughters years before coming to Knoxville. So we, we did not know about it. We weren't aware of it at all. But it came to light and charges were brought up and he was arrested. And so we, the church, tried our best to be sympathetic toward the victim. We weren't going to defend those actions. He was a member of the church there, but we, we wanted it known that this did not occur while he was one of us. Uh, we, we, we do not condone that. And so he and I, he was, before his trial, he and I were talking one day, just me and him privately. And he asked me, he said, well, Jeff, what do you think my options are? I said, well, what, what do you mean your options? Well, he wanted to find a way to wiggle out of this. He had a real sharp lawyer. And his lawyer had already indicated he had a few tricks up his sleeve. He was trying to get the whole thing dismissed, play, blame this, do this, so forth and so on. 
And I don't believe that fits the pattern. Go back to, um, I want to find uh, what Paul says. Verse 11. What, what did Paul say when he made his uh, defense before Festus and before he made his appeal? He said something very, very strong. If I've done anything that deserves death, meaning if I have truly violated civil law, what's a Christian supposed to do? When you take your medicine, you go to jail, you make restitution where it's necessary. If you've done something that's of a capital nature, capital crime, and our law deals with that specifically. And I believe as Christians, we, need to, we should believe in and support capital punishment because the scripture talks about it then if I, if I take a human life, then I need to forfeit my life. The Bible talks about that. I don't need to find a crooked lawyer. I'm not saying all lawyers are crooked. I'm just saying I don't need to find one who's going to let me wiggle out of this because I don't want to die. Well, then, I mean, I don't want to be trite, but, you know, if you don't want to do the time, then don't do the crime. Now, that's just the way that is. So I believe that's a responsibility with civil law. Christians need to own up to whatever the law dishes out you got to take it. And I believe that's what we need to do. E even though, even though, again, this is, our, this is our higher kingdom, and we are. We're going to stress that all the time. But we do live in this kingdom, civilly. We must be faithful citizens of it and do, and do, and do, what, to, do what it demands. So I thought that was something that Paul showed us in this chapter. Real quickly, God's providence, I believe, is at work in this chapter, always in the lives of his people. Paul did the, doing the unexpected, invoking his civil rights, it set in motion the chain of events that would eventually take him to where the Lord had already said, God, or Jesus had already told Paul what? You're going to witness for me, where? In Rome. Now, he didn't say, how are you going to get there? He just said, you're going to go to Rome. This was God using humanly chosen, if, if that's a proper sentence, humanly chosen actions that did not ever violate man's free will. Now, quickly, look at these verses. Look at Romans 8, 28. Now, by this time, Paul has already written Romans. But a very familiar verse, Romans 8, verse 28. What did Paul write there? All things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the call according to his purpose. Well, that's, that's God doing that. Now, how God pulls these events together without violating my free will, your free will, my good choices, my evil choices, that, that's up to God. Look in Philippians chapter 1. I wish I had more time to read these because the bell's going to catch me. But look at these. Now, what's unique about the Philippian letter and the letter to Philemon in terms of its timing? They were written in Rome during his first imprisonment. So we're not there yet. So I'm trying, to lay the, I'm trying to lay the path here. Paul has said, I'm willing to go to Rome. I'm, I make my appeal. He's already written, whatever God works out, it's always for his good. But in Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12, he would later write, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furnace of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard well, how would things have worked out for good to the palace guard if Paul hadn't made his appeal to Caesar? So you don't know that at the time that you make the choice. But God can cause that to work out for good. Look how the letter concludes in chapter 4, verse 22, when he's closing the letter. All the saints greet you, but especially who? Caesar. If Paul hadn't made his appeal... Could there have been saints in Caesar's household? Well, yes, there probably could have, but not through Paul's efforts. In Philemon, his little letter to Philemon, when he's bringing that letter to a close, he says in verse 10 to his friend, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my chains. Paul hadn't gone to Rome. He wouldn't have met Onesimus, and he wouldn't have converted him. Again, I'm not saying that he never would have become a Christian, but that's what happened because Paul made his appeal to Rome. And he even says in verse 
in verse uh, verse 15. For perhaps he departed for you for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but now as a brother. I'm just simply pointing out the possibility. Paul didn't know this either because he used the word perhaps. He, he didn't know. God's providence is up here working above the clouds and we don't know. It's like God's moving pieces on a chessboard. He's in charge of all that. But even in this story, I believe we see God's providence working. And I believe we can even teach the children. You know, God can work when I choose something, when I don't choose something, when I do this, when I don't do that. God can make good out of this. And look what happened with Paul's story. Good came of this. He preached the gospel while in prison. People who were even in Caesar's household obeyed the gospel. He met Onesimus, a runaway slave. He converted him because he made his appeal to Rome. And I think that's just a great lesson for us to teach our children. I think it's a very powerful Bible lesson on providence. All right. Lord willing, we'll come back together on Sunday morning and study chapter 26. So, again, I always appreciate your comments and your contributions to class.